Rural Heritage on RFD TV is brought to you by Rural Heritage Magazine, a bi monthly magazine featuring articles about farming and logging with draft animal power, small scale diversified family farming and homesteading, and other aspects of our rich rural heritage. Rural Heritage Magazine, borrowing from yesterday to do the work of today. For subscription information, please call 319 362 3027 or order online at www.ruralheritage.com. There are a lot of things I like about Ralph Rice. Too many to list, but I'll mention that one of the things Ralph impresses me with is his ability to clearly explain what he does on his farm, like plowing a field with his horses. Ralph makes it look easy, but it's a lot more complicated than you might think. When we visited oh. Ralph in spring 2019, He'd already plowed two-thirds of a sod field he was going to use for corn. The remaining third of the field was an odd shape, so Ralph had to make an adjustment to his plowing layout. He showed us first, using a pen and paper, how he laid out the field for plowing. I've tried to make a rough drawing of the field that I'm plowing and the, how I laid it out. Um, this field is about um, 200 feet wide. From here to here is about 200 feet. But as you notice, it's not a rectangle. That would make it very easy. Uh, unfortunately, it has this jog in the fence, um, and that's kind of left over from just the way the property lines run now. So what I do when I lay out a field, I make 25 paces. I start at the fence because obviously that's the straightest. So I make 25 paces across the field, and I put, I have a, piece of PVC plastic pipe that I weave in the fence so it sticks up in the air, uh, let's say right here. And then down here I put like a flag or something again at 25 feet, at 25 paces, I'm sorry. And that makes, that makes the back furrow, this 25 paces. And the, uh, then I'll make, I'll do the same thing, go another 25 paces. And each one of these areas in here is called a land. So this field is made up of three lands. Two that are rectangular in shape and then this oddball that we were working on this afternoon. The reason I make the 25 um, paces is that is just right for the horses as far as when you're turning. It's, it's just about the, you don't want to travel too far in between coming out of this furrow and going to the other side and um, as you come together that makes your ditches right in the field. <clears throat> so when I started out this field it had basically one dead furrow right down the center and when I finished this field this year I moved the ditches so now they're split like in thirds and there'll be one here when we get all finished. So you <clears throat> You strike out, and by doing, when I say strike out, that means laying out your field or starting to plow. So the first furrow, I go along the fence row and throw the dirt wherever that right-hand horse can comfort, comfortably walk against the fence. So we go down, and that's actually the easy part. We turn the horses around at that 25 paces flag, and I put my middle horse, or the seat of the plow, on that 25 paces. And I look up at this end of the field and see that big white stick and try to get the horses to go from this flag to that stick as straight as I can. So they, they walk up there and it looks about like my drawing. You zig where you zag, but the idea is to try to get it as straight as you can. Now, I have a right hand plow, so when the horses are going this direction, they're always throwing dirt to the right. So this dirt is going to the right. And this dirt is also going to the right, this way. So when I get to the end of the field here, I have to turn the horses around to the right and walk them right beside this slab of dirt that I just threw out. This is called your back furrow. So again, we go this direction, and this time we're throwing the dirt again to the right so that when you, if you were to have it um, looking at it, the, the furrow would be here, the dirt 
is up here and same way over here the furrow is here and the dirt's up here then the next you know your sod is here of course so the next time that you come down with the plow you're going to throw this dirt up Each, all these things would then fall this way and vice versa that's the back furrow and how that works so as you keep plowing the green you wind up with a, a strip here in the center so you're plowing all this sod this way and this side is coming this way so when you get to the center here which would be at around 12 or 13 paces you're left with this little thin strip and when you go down through there um, the second to the last time your right hand furrow horse is in a furrow your, my center horse is on that little strip of green and my outside horse is working on is walking in the furrow that we made when we came this direction as we finish that strip we get down to the end and turn around again and when we come back the next time now two horses are walking on the plowed ground and this right hand furrow horse is walking in the last furrow you made which is going to remove a little tiny strip and that is going to put a ditch right here in the center and this is called a dead furrow so when we finish now this land is completed and you have a ditch here you have a, uh, your back furrow here this ditch is your dead furrow there's no back furrow here because the fence is here we wouldn't throw dirt this way but the next land we start out <clears throat> we're going to do the same thing we're going to be plowing this direction and when we get to here we come back up this land so we have a flag here and now I move the PV stick over here PVC stick over here and do the same thing try to come up right to that stick I'm a terrible drawer and I apologize and you do the same thing over again so where I wound up then was I basically have this entire field is now planted to corn and that left me with this weird part so I struck out and turned this sod against the furrow right, right on the edge of the cornfield and here I had to figure out how am I gonna make I'm sorry how am I gonna make what am I gonna do when I get here well my drawing isn't quite right because this is a little more pronounced this angle it looks more like a rooftop this kind of comes out here more and then in so what I did I walked over 25 paces I kept doing it until I hit the 25 paces at which point I made a mark and I stuck my pipe down here on the fence so that I still wind up hopefully starting in when I'm finishing this corner will wind up so that I still wind up with a nice rectangle as much as I can so I'm plowing up and I'm coming down and I'm walking in a lot of grass here until I get where the furrow starts but as I continue to plow this it will eventually make it so that I'm all the way against the fence and only a small strip of grass will remain right up in here but all of this will be plowed and with any luck at all I'll wind up so that I have a ditch right here this will be my dead furrow right in the center of this land probably something like that because as I run out of fence then my rows are going to get shorter it'll be more like plowing this much like I illustrated on the paper this is my first dead furrow. So again, I started against the fence. I made my first pass up there. And my when I came down the field, I actually came down the field over here. So when I started out initially, this would have been a ditch or the dead furrow from last year. So my first land then technically went from about here to the fence on both ends so that left me that rectangle to plow plow the dirt out of the dead furrow that helps drain the surface water and we have had an abundance of surface water this year <laughs> for sure
and I don't do any anything different when I'm planting. I plant wherever the planter tells me to. I plant in 34 inch rows so I can cultivate with the horses. And it just worked out that this year I actually straddled this, but I can't say that happens every time and I don't worry about it if not. Because a lot of times there's no water in these dead furrows. But if you follow me, when we get ready to plow this next year, we'll start here. Our back furrow goes into the dead furrow and we work our way out so that our last furrow will go throw away from the fence and over here we'll, we'll come this direction too. So you essentially fill it in and take it out every, every time you plow. So in starting on the third land, I laid the furrow against the corn, which wasn't corn when I laid it out. But if you look up through there, you'll see kind of a green strip all the way through. It's not intentional, it's just the grass grew faster. And when you make your back furrow, the furrow should lay against each other, or worst case, one lays a little bit up on top. But you really want them to lay side by side. It's just very hard to keep a horse walking there, and not impossible. Occasionally I get it perfect, but not always. But anyways, in this case, we, it had a month to grow grass, so the grass is coming up through, and you can see the back furrow there. So we switched ends of the field to hopefully make it a little easier to understand. But as I came up this land over here, when I made the back furrow for this rectangle green strip you're looking at, I went up and then I had to find a spot over here on the fence to try to make the same, wind up with the same angle. So when I finish, I wind up with a nice rectangular strip. And if you look close at the end of this furrow, you'll see my white piece of PVC pipe stuck in the fence. That was my target. And if you look a little close, you'll see I headed down through there and then I said, oh, I'm not close enough. So I made a left turn and I got a little bit of a um, kind of a curve I got to work out. But at the end of the day, when I get all done, I can work at it a little bit just by having the horses stay a little to the right till I eat at that curve. But the main thing is when I finish this field, I'm plowing all the green upside down. So if I have a wider spot, I just have to make a couple more passes in that wider spot. You know. and then go around the other side and hook the other three. And it's very important everybody's hooked at the same length on their tug. Whoa.
We've done quite a bit of plowing this spring, but we don't have to be in a giant hurry. And believe me, resting the horses is good for them and gives you a chance to look at what you're doing. If you're in a hurry, horses probably aren't your thing. They'll force you to slow down, but it's a great life. My corn's planted. Other guys are still struggling. We've had a day off because of the rain, so they're full of it, but still behaving. <clears throat> when you get to the end of the furrow, you have to grab the handle and uh, raise the plow up out of the ground. So I switch the horses to one hand so I can use my other hand on the handle. Um, this is the older version Pioneer plow. It's not a foot lift, but there is a pedal that allows me to, helps me not have to raise it so hard with my arm. Come here, guys. Hey, hoss. Get out now. <clears throat> Come here. Try to look up between the two horses on the right's front legs so you're driving way up in front of your horses you can see what's coming. End of the furrow's coming up so getting ready to take it up out of the ground. Now normally we would just go <clears throat> just kind of spin around and go right back in the same place but this is a very odd shaped field and so I'm left with this triangular piece and it adds an extra layer to the plowing for sure because you're not just going back and forth and everything's an optical illusion so it looks crooked but I just keep plowing until the grass is all gone and well if there's more grass I just keep going um, this lever controls my furrow wheel I like to run it just a little bit towed out just to kind of as the horses pull the landslide against the dirt that kind of keeps it all running smooth and straight um, the coulter wheel in the front slices the sod so it helps it turn over easier. Sort of like pre-slicing your pizza, I guess. This lever is the lever to raise the plow in and out of the ground. I can't probably do it here very easy. But you can see my foot goes on here and hand and uh, that's how it goes up and down. I'm going to do my best to explain to everybody what I mean when I would say I hitch my three horses bit to bit and why I think it gives me more control and also why I think it gives the horses more comfort. This is just standard check line that you know for your team lines. Your inside line should be three or four inches longer than your outside line and the way you know which is which your outside line runs from your where your butt line snap in that should be the piece goes all the way up to that outside horse. Your inside line obviously is a little bit longer. <clears throat> you want to check and make sure they're like that. Um, it's, you'll, you'll discover that you have more control that way. <clears throat> Same thing on your right hand horse. The shorter line goes to the outside. The longer line comes to the inside. So when you're going to drive two horses, your, your lines are in that configuration. As you pull the right line, you pull on the right side of both horses' mouth. That's your G line. Turn left, opposite is a, uh, in, in place. That's haw. Now, when I add the third horse in the middle, not a lot changes. <clears throat> The third horse, of course, comes in the middle. <clears throat> the team lines that went to the, out, the inside of your horses now go to your middle horse. You don't even have to adjust the line because the spacing doesn't change. You're adding a horse, but the spacing doesn't change. 
What does change a little bit is these straps here. These are just straps that I made up that gives the spacing between the two horses. And they're 18 to 20 inches. You have to kind of play around a little bit till you, you get each horse so they have it figured out. And then you connect those, these straps, the short straps, to the inside bit on both of your outside horses. Now, nothing has changed. When I telegraph to the horses that I want them to make a right hand turn, I'm gonna pull on my right line which will pull on the right side of the center horse's mouth, the outside of the right hand horse's mouth. Again, no changes. When they turn right, the horse on the left, he's already heard me say G, he knows what's coming. And as, he, as they turn, he turns right with them because this is snapped into his bit. They're keeping the same spacing, it's the same left and right. <clears throat> Unlike a jockey stick, I put my colts in the center. The reason is I have 100% of that colt at all times. I have a gelding or whatever, broke horse on either side. They pretty much aren't gonna do anything. She has to do what they do. <clears throat> now, I don't start a three horse hitch with a super green horse, but believe me, Abby didn't start working the three horse hitch until the very end of March, like the last two or three days in March. So she's worked March, part of April and May and you've seen how she was today. Most of that is because my geldings are broke, they know what's going on. She's a quiet horse, but it's also because I have control. She has to learn voice control because the geldings either push or pull her around a little bit until she does. And secondly, I'm driving her every step of the way. When I say, whoa, I have 100% a hold of her. The geldings, of course, I have control, but not as much as I have on the center horse. So in this configuration, set up the way I do, center horse, you have the most control. There are other methods with three lines. Some guys use two lines and uh, tie back to the hames. I'm not gonna speak bad about any of those. I'm just gonna say this one, in my opinion, gives me 100% control and it's very comfortable on the horses. Sure, they're gonna wear it with a little bit of skin and it's a long way from their heart. They're not gonna die from it but it's not as hard as a jockey stick poking and pulling and yanking on them. The same thing when you have a line horse tied back to a hame, it's the same thing. You, they can't feel you through the lines like they can on this. And when your right hand or left hand horse turns, they're not getting the pressure as quickly at the bit, they're getting it more mid body. So I'm not gonna say a horse won't learn that, I'm just saying if you haven't tried this, try it. Two straps is all you need to go from two to three. And their little, I mean, a hame strap would probably do it. You'd have to check. But I had those made, and I put extra holes in them so you can adjust in or out depending on what you need. Um, if you were going to use it in a carriage or something like that, you can actually fine-tune that a lot more by um, adjusting your lines back here if you would need to or the, the ones in the front. I have found out that this works perfect on everything. Three horses in the four cart three horses in the power cart, three horses in the wagon with a wagon, three horse evener, and of course plowing with no tongue, no neck yoke, and you saw them perform today. Thanks for joining us today at Rural Heritage and RFD TV, where we borrow from yesterday to do the work of today. This program is available for purchase. To order your copy, please call 319-362-3027 or visit www.ruralheritage.com. Rural Heritage is a bi-monthly magazine dedicated to draft animal farming and logging, as well as other aspects of our rich rural heritage. It is published by Mishka Press, which also offers a complete line of back-to-the-land books, DVDs, and calendars. Call or write for a catalog or subscription information, or visit our website at www.ruralheritage.com.